uh, you may know about him. He, this is uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, and Mark Zuckerberg is one of the 1%. No, he's one of the one, one millionth of 1%, probably. Uh, He's one of the highest income individuals in the United States. And he's going to be with us tonight um, because uh, it turns out that uh, we have this uh, nice website here that in a second is going to start telling you how much money Mark Zuckerberg is going to be making while we sit here. Uh, there he goes. OK. Uh, and you can see it's pretty damn fast. So uh, we'll. we'll uh, we're starting him out now, and we'll check in with him at the end and see how, how well he's done in the interim. So now let me see. Uh, OK, all right. So he, he's still working back there. Don't worry about it. <laughs> as, you, as you know, he works very hard. You can see by how much money he's making. Um, uh, he's still back there. So, what I'm going to, I want to do three things tonight, um, basically, and to give you a roadmap of where I'm going. The first thing is I want to talk to you a little bit about um, theories of justice, and I'm, a couple of theories of justice that Dane presented to us, um, and that inform economic thinking about, about questions in what we call welfare economics. Um, I want to talk about those a little bit, um, expand a little bit on what Dane said. And then I want to describe uh, what has happened to the distribution of income, um, to what we might call distributive justice, um, over the last uh, oh, 20 or 30 years. And then finally, try to uh, figure out what the, and, and of course, you all know what that story is. The story is that there's been an enormous increase in inequality in the distribution of income. Uh, and so the last part of it then is, to try to, to figure out where that's coming from. Uh, why is that increase in, in, in income dis inequality happening? And to some extent, it's going to be left to you to figure out whether those are just or unjust increases in inequality. Uh, I'm gonna start, I guess I'm going to make the presumption that uh, it's, it's all inequality is not bad. There are differences in income, which I think everybody would find justifiable. So for example, if you, know, you go to work um, at uh, $20 an hour and work a full week, and your uh, coworker goes to work for $20, at $20 an hour, same, same wage as you do, uh, but decides to take you know, 10 hours off to go skiing. Uh, and as a result, earns a, a third less than you do. You, that, we're not going to be too upset about that as being an unjust difference. So well, there are there are differences that are that are justified. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start then with the idea of talking about the notion of justice in economic theory, and um, I'm, I'm going to take off from where where Dane left us um, two weeks ago, uh, and and the first uh, sort of theorists. Uh, the, the, the first sort of author of, uh, justice, of a justice theory that informs economics is this guy, Jeremy Bentham, um, uh, who, uh, was the, uh, who founded utilitarianism. And the, op and the principle that, uh, as, as Dane explained it to us, is um, according to Bentham, uh, what is, is right and just to do is the greatest good for the greatest number. And that's, the, that's a, the famous utilitarian principle, the greatest good for the greatest number. The other uh, sort of strain of, uh, of thought that informs uh, economic thinking uh, or, and, 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 eco and, and welfare economics is the idea of libertarianism. Um, and uh, Milton Friedman is probably the... the um, the famous example of a, of, a, of a libertarian, one of the best ex known examples of a libertarian. And, and the basic idea that, lay, that Dane presented to us was that, uh, that, that no distribution of, of income, no distribution of rewards can be just unless it is the result of 
free people operating freely with one another in free markets. Uh, it's a political or a philosophical notion uh, about what is the uh, just way to come up with, a, uh, of re with rewarding people. So let's look at the, but, but I'm going to start with, with, the, uh, with the Benthamite notion of um, the, 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 the notion is that, is that uh, we need to do the greatest good for the greatest number. Economists immediately have a problem with this. Okay, and here's the problem. Okay, I'm, I'm listing here three actions, one, two, and three. Okay, which if potentially affect uh, ten individuals. So, you, and you can see that what action number one does is that it lavishly rewards individual number one, somewhat number two, not a little bit number three. But well, we're supposing that these numbers measure the quote good that's being done. Okay, so if we add all that up, it's 155. That's, that's a lot of good. Okay. Uh, now, uh, action number two, as you can see, uh, provides 20 worth of good uh, for six people, and that's a total of 120. Okay. And then action number three is, of course, provides a little bit of good for five people, uh, and that's a total of 50. Uh, 50, yeah, for, I mean, sorry, five for 10 people, so that's a total of 50. So what's the greatest good for the greatest number? Okay. The problem here is that um, Benton prevents us, presents us with a mathematical impossibility, which is the double maximization. So the problem of a double maximand is what, is what we would call it. You can't simultaneously maximize two things. Okay. So uh, we, we, we just don't know whether this is, which, which one of these is the greatest good for the greatest number. Three is the greatest number, one is the greatest good. Okay, if, you're, if we're talking about good here. In a sense, what an economist would say is that Bentham's trying to do two things here. That there's two things that are involved. One is efficiency. And the efficiency notion is that you're trying to get the greatest good. Efficiency means you're trying to get the most out of the resources you have at your disposal. And that's what an economy is supposed to be doing there. That's what an economy is all about. It has all of these resources at its disposal. It's supposed to take those resources and produce good for people, which in the economic context means material well-being. Okay. So Bentham in saying it, we're trying to produce the greatest good is talking about an efficiency concept, at least in terms of the econom economists use that. And when he talks about the greatest number, he's talking about a distributive justice concept. Okay. And he's rolling the two together in a, in a way that you just can't do. You cannot have the most just and the most efficient solution necessarily. It may be by accident you can, but not, near, not generally speaking. And so economists immediately have a tr trouble with what uh, Bentham is doing here. Uh, and, but they have an even bigger problem. And the bigger problem that they have is that, they, is that economists conceive of the good that the economy produces it, as something that is inherently subjective. That is to say, it, it, we, we talk about people having experiencing utility and having a utility function that maps uh, the consumption of goods and services into the production of some kind of well-being or utility. There are lots of problems with utility theory, and I don't want to dwell on those. But the, but the critical point here is, is the notion of subjectivity. And subjectivity means that we can't really add up all of these things. We don't really know how much. I mean, we don't have any kind of meter that we can kind of screw into Dane's ear here. That, oh, seven. You know, that's how much utility he's experiencing right now. We don't have any way of measuring it objectively. And if we can't measure his objectively and mine objectively and Patricia's objectively, we can't add them up. So we can't even get at a concept of efficiency very well. And so um, we're kind of at a loss. Well, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to introduce this guy. 
Vilfredo Pareto. And, 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 and Pareto said, that we're going to solve the problem this way. He's going to say, we're going to say that we're, over, we're, we're producing more good. That is, we're increasing efficiency. We're getting more. We're producing more good if we can make some people better off without making anybody else worse off. Okay. If we can make some people better off without making anybody else worse off. A Pareto efficient move is a move or an action. It's an action that makes some people better off but makes nobody else worse off. Great idea, right? Except it, <laughs> when does that happen? <laughs> okay. When does that happen? It's, a, it's kind of a problem because almost anything we do okay, involves any, any change in the state of affairs in the economy is going to make some people better off, but it's going to almost always going to make somebody else worse off. And so um, we, we, we can bring another uh, famous economist into the mix, John Hicks, a British economist, who said, oh, well, you know, we don't actually have to settle for approving of only those things that make some people better off and other people worse off as long as the people who win are willing to enable to compensate the people who lose. Okay. So that's where, where economists kind of end up on this notion of efficiency. They end up with the idea that um, we should approve of things that make some people better off without making anybody else worse off, or, and we should approve of things that make some people better off, well enough better off, that there's the possibility of compensating the losers. The question of whether we should actually compensate the losers or not is another story. So um, what I want to just ask, ask you to think about or reflect upon a little bit is, what is, is there any notion of justice there? in this idea, in, in this concept of efficiency? And I think there is one notion of justice, and then there's a, there, there's a way in which, in, in, in which our ability to think about justice is very limited. The, way, the, the one notion of justice is, is the idea that, uh, that I mean, is, is it unfair? Is it reasonable? Is it fair? Is it just? That if somebody can be made better off and nobody else is hurt, isn't, isn't that good? I mean, isn't that fair? Isn't that just? Isn't that reasonable? That if one person can be, if I, if I can do better and it doesn't happen to hurt any of you, should you resent that fact? You know? Should you resist that? Um, I, I heard an economist. Uh, <laughs> from the Brookings Institution on the radio the other morning. Maybe some of you heard it. They're, they're the, the business show on the, on, on, in the morning is doing this thing on, uh, on uh, inequality. And, and this guy said, Mark Zuckerberg, nobody's hurt by Mark Zuckerberg making a lot more money. It doesn't hurt you that, make, that Mark Zuckerberg makes more money. And you know, in a way, we, we kind of respect that um, in our civic and political life. I mean, think of all of the conversation that circulated around about Mitt Romney and the money that he makes. People say, well, yeah, I mean, some people, hey, he's really rich and, you know, they don't like it. But then a lot of people say, well, he earned it. It was okay. I mean, there was nothing wrong with that. So there is, uh, I think, in that notion that it's okay for people to make more as long as nobody else is hurt. There is an element of justice in that in that in that Pareto, optimi uh, uh, Pareto efficiency idea. On the other hand, okay, here's the serious limitation that arises, and that is that changes in the distribution of income that appear to us to be perfectly reasonable and obviously a good thing to do, like for example, if uh, I mean, Warren Buffett is even willing to do it himself. He says, I'll give up some of my money. If, if we take $500 from Warren Buffett and we give it to some impoverished person who can't buy food, almost everybody's going to say, the world's a better place and a more just place. But it fails the test. Okay. 
because there's not something left, because the winner in that redistribution, which is the poor person, cannot compensate the loser, which is Warren Buffett, for his loss because he'd have to give the 500 back and he wouldn't be ahead. So there's a very serious limitation in the concept, but on the other hand, there is an element that I think is, that, that does reflect notions of justice. The other thing I want, then, then let's get, the, let's, let's consider the, the, is, the issue of libertarianism and where that fits into this. And I, and I think it fits in in, in, in the idea of the, the relationship between libertarianism and distributive justice. The real argument, I think, for free markets, and this is not, I mean, you can find lots of stuff wrong with this, but the argument, the fundamental argument for free markets is, I mean, it, there, there is all the question of political liberty uh, involved in free markets, but I'm setting that aside. The other, the other element is that economists will argue that free market, and Milton Friedman would argue this, free markets are efficient. Okay? If we want to get the most out of our resources, if we want to um, uh, approach that sort of Pareto bliss state that we're talking about, um, then uh, economists like Friedman will argue that the way to do that is through free markets. And the basic argument is, is pretty well understood. People go to markets, to buyers go to markets to buy the things that will give them satisfaction and well-being. And sellers, uh, if they're going to make money, are going to provide, are going to use resources to provide those things that people want. So it, the, the, the whole market directs resources into producing what people want. And what people want is what gives them satisfaction, and so we'll kind of maximize satisfaction. That's the way, that's the, way the story goes. So that's um, clear enough. But, <laughs> and, and, but what does that have to do with, with um, justice? And, and, I, and I will make this argument, and I'll, at least I'll suggest this argument. You can take me on about it if you'd like. It, do, does, does efficiency promote justice? You know, efficiency sounds terrible. You know, it's some cold, heartless thing that economists talk about. You know, efficiency. You know, Taylor. You know, Taylorism, and you know, making the assembly line go faster. Charlie Chaplin, modern times. I mean, you can you can imagine it all. Efficiency sounds cold and heartless, and it sounds like it doesn't have anything to do with justice. But what if the opposite of efficiency is waste? Is waste virtuous or just? Does it promote social justice? Last week, Rebecca was talking about the idea that waste, fraud, and corruption inhibited justice. And when you think about a poor country, and when you think about horrible waste occurring in a poor country, if you think about in a poor, or, or even in a rich country, if you think about um, spending billions of dollars on military hardware, for example, rather than on children's health, that's wasteful. And it certainly doesn't promote justice. So there is an argument, I think, to be made for, 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 for efficiency being at least helping to promote justice. Um, the other argument, of course, that, that Friedman would make is that um, when all those people um, use their resources to produce the things that people want, they get rewarded. They get rewarded in relation to the contribution that they're making. Uh, and again, if we refer back to the conversation, well, to what Dane said and to what Rebecca said about the necessity of finding some way of rewarding people for producing science and technology that serves the welfare of people, um, then uh, we recognize that, that's, that, that there's something important about re rewarding people for what they do, for what they contribute. It's an active potential 
principle of justice in terms of how we reward people. So that's all I'm going to say about that. But, um, but uh, and so let me go on. So what I'm, do, what I'm talking about now is what has happened. And here's the story um, that in some variety or other we all know. This is the growth in real inflation corrected after tax household income between 1979 and 2007. This data and a lot of the data that I'm going to be looking for comes from a comprehensive analysis by the Congressional Budget Office. When we talk here about real, that is inflation corrected, this is how much income has grown beyond what any, any influence of inflation or, or price increases. It's household income, and it's corrected for household size. Uh, because you, you can't, you can't co compare the income of a family of one or a household of even one uh, with a household of 10. And so to correct for household size, what they do is they take the income of the household and they divide by the square root of the number of people who are in the household. Um, and so that it's corrected in that respect. Uh, and here's how. And, how it has grown over the two, from 1979 to 2007. And uh, it's organized by quintile. Those are 20, percent, 20 percentage groups. So this is the lowest 20% of the population. You can see that the lowest 20% of households have had their income grow over, what, 28 years over 28 years, their income has grown by a little less than 3%, by a little less than 2.5%. So if you put that on an annual basis, it comes down to almost nothing. Almost nothing. Um, same thing in the second quintile, third quintile, fourth quintile. Almost all of the fifth quintile, the 81st to the 99th percentile of the population, and then, of course, they've, they've grown a little bit more. But then, you look at what happened to the top 1%. And their income grew by 275%, roughly, over the same period, where everybody else was growing at you know, something like 2.5%. You know, OK. Here's another way of looking at it. What happened to shares of income? Uh, the blue columns show you the, sh the share of total income for each of these income groups in 1979, and the red columns show the share in 2007. Okay. Um, if any group has a share less than 20%, then they're below average, right? So. Everybody has below average income. This is the inverse of Lake Wobegon. Okay. <laughs> In the United States, everybody's below average, or almost everybody is below average. Uh, it, up, up until, excuse me, up until the fourth quintile, so 80% of the population has income that's below average. Okay. And their share has fallen even of the top 20%. Now, it's not all of the top 20%. Part of the top, of the top, it's not the top 20%. It's the top 19%, just short of the top one. Uh, but even that group has, has had its share fall. And of course, the share of the top 1%, all of those shares that were lost went to the top 1%. So that shows you kind of the extent of it. This is market income which means it's the income that people actually earn before they receive, before they pay any taxes and before they receive any kinds of transfer payments or assistance from the government in any form. OK. Here's uh, shares of income after transfers and federal taxes in 1979 and 2007. Now, by transfers, we mean essentially Social assistance programs like, this is just federal programs that we're looking at here. We mean uh, programs like uh, principally Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security. 
Uh, and then to a lesser degree, although these are important for low-income groups in particular, we mean uh, the, the TANF uh, uh, program, the uh, temporary food assistance, uh, and, um, and aid, to fam aid to families, uh, to low-income families. SNAP and TANF are the two um, assistance programs that replaced the old um, welfare programs of uh, of the uh, aid to families with dependent children and the welfare reform program in the, in the, in the, during the Clinton administration. So what do you see here? Well, what you see here is that, uh, it's, it, and it's a little hard to tell, but you, you see essentially the same pattern. It's a little different because the, ol the, the only, first of all, the share that, uh, say, the lowest quintile has here of total income is higher uh, after taxes and after transfers is higher than if you look back at the market income. Okay. Uh, and that's actually true uh, through quite a range here. So what that means is that uh, these programs, and we'll see a little bit more detail, are, 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 pro are quote, progressive. Okay. The after-tax distribution of income the after tax and transfer distribution of income is more equal than the, pre, than the market distribution of, of income. Um, and the other thing you might notice here, you remember that the uh, share of this group here, the almost super rich, uh, fell, if you were talking about market income over this period, it rose if you're talking about after, after tax and after transfer income. Here's, here's another way of seeing um, how the, the effect of taxes and transfers. The blue columns show the share of market income. The red columns show the share of, um, of after tax and transfer income. So in other words, after you take account of taxes and transfers, the lowest quintile, the second quintile, the third quintile, the, excuse, excuse me, the middle quintile, yeah, the third quintile, they all increase their share. Okay. And the fourth quintile, the fifth quintile, and the top 1% decrease their share. Okay. This is the, the numbers for 1979. Okay. Here's the same story, basically, for, 19, for 2007. Okay. What is hard to see, and so we'll, we'll look at this one here, what is hard to see is that the progressivity of the tax and transfer system. That is, its ability to reduce income inequality has gone down over the, the, this 28-year period. Because what you see happening here is, of course, you see the share of the, what, what you see in the blue columns is how the share of this lowest quintile changed. In market income, its share went down 13.8%, but its share of after-tax income went down 28%. Okay, that's how much the per the share changed. The top one the the top one percent. Okay. Its market income went up. Its market share doubled. To a by or went up by 102%. Its after uh, tax and transfer share went up 122 percent. So what that and what happened in this period then is that although the tax and transfer system is this is all again remember this is the federal tax and transfer system although it is progressive that is it reduces inequality it doesn't do it as much as it used to. There were a number of things that happened here. One was that there was a shift in transfers away from uh, transfers to low-income families and towards Social Security and Medicare. Uh, another was uh, a shift in taxes to direct payroll taxes away from income taxes and so forth, and they're more regressive. There's a number of factors that were going on here. But the, th the, the total effect was that one of the reasons then that we 
have seen an increase in inequality in the actual effective after-tax and after-transfer income of people is that the progressiveness of, our, of the social system has gone down. Progressiveness meaning its ability to reduce inequality. And it's gone down over this period of time. I want to show you a little bit about Montana as opposed to the United States. Uh, and this is a different measure. This is a different measure of inequality. This is the measure uh, in which we take the ratio of average family income for the richest 20% of families to the average family income of the poorest 20% of families. It's different data, different time periods, but it's still nevertheless indicative. And what you see here is that in Montana in the late 1980s, the richest 20% of families had an average income that was about five and a quarter times as high, 5.2 times as high as the families that were in the poorest 20%. Now, that's obviously a measure of inequality. The bigger that number is, the more unequal the distribution of income is. In the United States, the number was six. So income was more evenly distributed in Montana in the 1980s than it was in the rest of the country. And as time went on, uh, the difference between in the income, income inequality in Montana did rise. So that ratio went from 5.2%, so that by the mid-2000s, it was 5.7%. 5 .7. That is, rich families had an average income 5.7 times as high as poor families. But in the country as a whole, that ratio went from 6 to 7.3. So two things about Montana. Income is more equally distributed than it is in the country as a whole. And over this period, income inequality has grown less rapidly than in the country as a whole. And here's, a, and here's and there's kind of an interesting reason why. You might say, well, why is it that, um, that, uh, that income inequality didn't grow as fast in Montana as it did in the rest of the country? Why is that? Is it because poor people in Montana did better than poor people in the rest of the country? Or is it because rich people in Montana didn't do as well as rich people in the rest of the country? What do you think the right answer is? Well, the right answer is rich people didn't do as well in Montana as they did in the rest of the country. Okay. Uh, here you see what happened. Th th this blue column here says that in, in the late 1980s, poor families in Montana, that is in the, in the bottom quintile, had, a had average family incomes that were 90% of the average family incomes in the, of poor people in the rest of the United States. Whereas rich people in Montana, they're still rich. They're just not as rich as the rich people in the rest of the country uh, because they were getting like 78%, up to 79%. By the mid-2000s, okay, 20 years later approximately, poor people in Montana still retained the same relative position with respect to poor people in the rest of the country. But rich people in Montana's position had deteriorated significantly compared to rich people in the other. In other words, don't look for the 1% in Montana. They're not here. <laughs> okay. They are not here. Okay. We know that. Where are they? They're in the Silicon Valley. They're in um, New York. I don't know. They're, they're not here. Okay. And because we don't have those people, we don't have that super rich level here, we uh, experience much less growth of inequality than the rest of the nation. OK, now another question that arises, or a critique that's frequently made of these, uh, of, of these analyses of, uh, of, of, of income distribution 
is that they're on an annual basis. We looked at the numbers for a particular year. And uh, the observation is frequently made that people move around in the income distribution. If, if, if you're in the bottom of the pile this year, but in the top of the pile next year, if you should be, happen to be so lucky to move from the bottom 20% to the 1%, okay, or if you happen to be so unlucky as to move from the 1% down to the 20th percentile, then um, obviously if we look over time, okay, this year I'm doing well and Dane's doing lousy. Next year, Dane's doing well and I'm doing lousy. Over the two years, we're doing about the same. Okay. So this year, there's a lot of inequality because I'm doing well and Dane's doing lousy. Next year, there's a lot of inequality because Dane's doing well and I'm doing lousy. But over the two years, there's no inequality at all. Okay. So the question arises, how much of that mobility actually exists out there? And how important is it? And here's, uh, there's a lot of ways to skin this cat, believe me. Uh, but uh, here's some uh, indicative information, and that is, uh, this is a study done by um, a, a woman, who, a researcher at the Bank of, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. And she used what's called panel data, which means that it's data that looks at a whole bunch of people and follows them through time, uh, and asked for how much, to see how much mobility they actually experienced. And it, what these numbers show you is, this is the, like, the red line shows you the percentage of people who at the beginning of that, for example, 1979 to 1980 period, back there, there, how, what percentage of the people who were at the, in the bottom 20th percentile managed to get two or more quintiles away? In other words, managed to get from the bottom quintile to the third or fourth or higher, or into the 1%. Okay. And the answer was, well, it's about 22%. Okay. Which means that 80%, okay, or so, or 75%, 76, 77, something like that, didn't. Okay. They managed this, they were stuck there. Okay. Uh, and the blue line shows you the number of people who were in the richest quintile who managed to go down were faded or unfortunately had to go down from uh, the highest quintile to the, down to the third or lower. Okay. And you can see that's a slightly lower number. Okay. But the important thing to see here is that there is a general downward trend in this mobility. Okay. There certainly is no increase in mobility that would say, oh, well, that increase in mobility is refreshing to know that. because at least that means that offsetting this increase in inequality is an increase in mobility. But it didn't happen. Uh, if anything, it, uh, the mobility was slightly reduced. When economists try to analyze, say, 10 years worth of income inequality, where you sum up people's income over 10 years, uh, when, you, when you try and do, do that, there is, of course, some reduction in inequality, but it's not dramatic. So the phenomena of mobility is, um, uh, is, is not going to rescue us from this dilemma. Okay. Don't be thinking that that 1% is going to be you know, occupying Wall Street tomorrow. And don't be thinking that uh, Poor people are going to be get, collecting one percenters incomes tomorrow. Okay. So uh, the, the growth of inequality is, is uh, resistant to being dismissed on the basis of um, enhanced mobility. Okay, now in order to move along here a little bit and, and to try and understand where changes in inequality are coming from, we need a single measure of inequality. And uh, the one that's commonly used is something called the Gini coefficient. Um, and don't worry about this. It's very easy. Look, all you have to do, uh, 
Ah, yeah, you know, yeah. You don't, we don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. Okay. We, uh, I, 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 uh, it, there is an easier way of understanding what the Gini coefficient is. So let's go back to this again. What do you have to do? Well, what the way we're going to find the Gini coefficient is we're going to start with the perfectly sensible idea that we're going to take every pair of households in the economy. And that's going to be me and Dane, Dane and Patricia, Patricia and me, me and Linda, so on. We're going to take every single difference for all pairs of households in the economy. So for example, you know, we might take Mark Zuckerberg, who had $2,147,483,647 worth of income. And Warren Buffett was a measly $62 million, uh, $855,038 worth of income. And the difference then would be $2,084,000,000, et cetera. Okay. So that's just an example of one okay, that we're going to do. Um, and, but we're going to take all of them. Okay. And obviously, those differences that we find out there express how much income dis dispersion there is. But what we want to do is find the average of them all. Okay. So that, that's a sort of, sort of sensible way of, of talking about how much inequality there is. What's the average difference? If you randomly selected two people off the street and tried to guess what's the difference in their income going to be, well, you'd guess it's going to be the average. That's what the, your best guess would be. Uh, so you guess it's going to be the average. So we'll find the average. Okay. And then what we're going to do is work for obscure reasons, uh, which will come, become clear in a moment here. We're going to divide by two, okay? And then we're going to compute that half of that average distance as a, in, in, in relation, the ratio, half of that average difference to average income. Okay? And the reason we want to take this last step here is because I mean, suppose we found the average difference between households was $20,000. Uh, well, if the average income in the economy was $30,000, that would be a huge difference. But if the average income was, was the average difference was $30,000, but everybody was making $500,000, you wish, uh, it wouldn't, it would, it would, uh, you know, clearly be a very small difference, and there wouldn't be much dispersion. So that's why we express it as an average. And that gives us the Gini coefficient. Okay. Now, we're going to compute a Gini coefficient, just to make this a little clearer here. Oh! <laughs> What's he up to? $791,000. Okay. Um. Oh! Okay. I have a little widget here for us to... Uh, compute uh, a Gini coefficient. Uh, if you recognize these names up here, these are five, five families uh, in, the, uh, in, in this little economy that we're going to compute the Gini coefficient for. And if you recognize these names here, uh, you've faithfully read your program. Uh, if you don't recognize those names, uh, then don't worry about it. Okay. The same names appear down here. So um, we'll, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to introduce some income levels. Uh, and this is going to compute the Gini coefficient. Because what it's going to do is in these little green cells, we're going to find the difference in income. For example, this little cell will have the difference in income between Hobby and Jillison. Uh, and this one will have the difference between Hobby and Boone and Jillison and Boone and so forth. So all of our differences in income are going to appear in these little green cells when I start putting income levels in up here. And then it's, the little thing is going to compute the average income. It's going to compute the average difference. And it's going to tell us a Gini coefficient. Okay. So let's start with the most unequal distribution of income we can possibly imagine, okay? uh, which would be when one person had all the income and nobody else had any. Okay. Uh, I, do you do you want to be the? Sure. Okay, we'll make Linda the, the 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 rich one here. So we're going to give her. Oh, let's give her fifty thousand dollars. 
worth of income. Okay, well, we gave her $50,000 worth of income. This is an extremity of inequality. Only one person gets anything. Okay, uh, it happens to be uh, Linda. And she gets $50,000. And, and here you see all the differences that are computed between her income and everybody else's. Okay. And the average income is 10000 the average is 20000 and the Gini coefficient is 1. So that's something to remember. A Gini coefficient is 1. When the Gini coefficient is 1, that's as high as it can get, and that represents complete inequality. Complete inequality. Now, let's go to the opposite extreme okay, and give everybody the same income as Linda. So that well, we're going to give her, we're going to give Hobby 50,000. We're going to give Boone 50,000. Oh, I didn't give Hobby 50, did I? Okay. Oh. Don would never forgive me for that. <laughs> I, you know, for many years I negotiated labor contracts with him. I, was, I represented the union and he represented uh, management. And um, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm, st I, I'm still there and I can <laughs> Is he in Hawaii? Yeah. <laughs> I, I got to eat my heart out on that one. Okay, total equality. Of course, there's no differences in income. So the Gini coefficient is going to be zero. Okay. Now let's do one more, because this is kind of, kind of interesting. Now I'm going to put in, uh, for hobby, I'm going to give him, I'm going to give him 23, thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars and I'm going to give uh, Linda sixty nine thousand three hundred and fifty dollars and I'm going to give Ann and Tom hundred and fifteen nine hundred we're getting better here Jerry's going to get one hundred and eighty five hundred and Pat and Kitty get five hundred and sixty thousand five hundred dollars. How's that? Now the the reason I, I chose these I, I chose these numbers at random. No, I did not choose these numbers at random. If you look up here at the shares, 2.5%, 7%, 12%, 19 and 59%, those are roughly the shares of the, f of the, f of the, f of the five quintiles in the U.S. population today, in the U.S. economy today. So this is roughly the Gini coefficient for the United States distribution of income. It's a little high because of, because when you use big groups rather than individuals, it comes out funny. But, but th that's, that's how we would calculate the Gini coefficient. And that's where we are. So if zero is perfect equality, and one is perfect inequality, or complete inequality, the Gini coefficient ranges over that range, and where we are in the United States today is at about 0.6. Okay, at about 0.6. So now let me go back to the um, to the, to the uh, slides here. Let's see. I just flick through them here. Okay. 
Now, what's useful about this Gini coefficient is, as I say, it allows us to do a number of things, including, um, here, here's just a, oh, let me start that. So it's the full screen. Uh, is that it, it allows you to, uh, in this case, trace a long history of, of inequality in the United States. Um, let me just say that these two red points represent estimates. This was before we actually could calculate Gini coefficients. We had the data to calculate Gini coefficients. But these represent estimates for 1929 and 1947. The general story is that over a long period of time, up until about the mid-1970s or early 1970s, inequality was falling in the United States. Okay. Inequality was falling, and then, starting in the 1970s, it began to grow. So it was, it, it, and it, it was a significant departure. There are lots of um, reasons in economic theory to expect inequality to fall. To the extent that inequality is based on what we call, might call non-competitive differences, like regional differences, or racial differences, or gender differences, economic theory predicts that competition is going to try and, try and erase those things, and that you're going to get some kind of convergence uh, in incomes um, o over time. And, and that did indeed happen. As those kinds of barriers, barriers, for example, to interregional mo mo mobility, when you see large migrations, for example. If you see a large migration of African Americans from the south of the United States to the northern industri industrial belt in the, way back in the 30s and 40s, uh, that would have the effect of reducing inequality because people would be escaping extraordinarily low incomes in the Mississippi Delta and, and making more money. Not, still not as much as white people made, but I mean, making more money than they otherwise would have made. And so those forces were reducing inequality until sometime in the 1970s. And then since then, as you can see, there's been a gradual increase. Another useful uh, application of the Gini coefficient is to, is, um, am I, have I really talked for 10 minutes? Have I talked for a whole hour? No. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I, got, I got to hurry along here. I was completely wrong about how long I was going to take. <laughs> Here's Gini coefficients for OECD countries in the United States, very high compared to most uh, OECD countries. Um, Mexico, Israel, Germany, Portugal, Chile, et cetera, uh, have higher inequality. Uh, and this is the effect of the progressiveness of the tax and transfer system. Um, how much is the Gini coefficient reduced by the tax and transfer system? Again, the United States is relatively low. Which means that when you combine those two factors, the United States has more unequal after-tax income than almost any country in the OECD with the exception of uh, Mexico and um, Turkey, I believe. OK, this, I, got, I really do have to move. Oh my god, I can't believe it. Oh. OK. These are, these are uh, w when we talk about market income, when we're trying to find out why uh, income is unequally distributed, we have to talk about where does income come from. Uh, and most of the income, market income, that people get before the government's impact is felt is labor income, okay, 72%. Um, this, is, uh, this is business income. That's income from partnerships and proprietorships. It, in, it both involves both property and labor income. Capital gains from, this is realized capital gains from the appreciation of, uh, uh, financial assets and so forth. Um, capital income means dividends, uh, interest payments, royalties, etc. And then this is other is a, a grab bag of stuff. So these these little uh, pluses and minus signs tell you 
which of these became more or less important over this period of time. And so you can see that labor income became less important, business income, capital gains doubled in its proportion of, uh, of, of total income, uh, capital income went down, and so forth. This, this table shows you now, okay, now we have those different categories of income. How equally or unequally distributed are they? Okay, and how did that change over time? And what you see down here is at the bottom is the labor income is fairly equally distributed. Okay, um, and that capital gains income and, uh, and business income are rather unequally distributed. Capital income falls somewhere in between. Uh, and they all grew over, the, over time. To, to make that a little bit clearer, I, I, I sh to show you the growth, I put them all on the basis of starting at one so that, so that you could see how much they grew. And what's, what's really interesting to see here is how sustained the growth of labor income inequality is. Why is that interesting and important? It's interesting and important because labor income is such a big piece of the pie, puzzle. Okay. So if you're looking for where did increasing inequality come from, one big piece of it has to be it comes from the fact that the biggest source of income was becoming more unequally distributed. You can't answer the problem unless you know why labor income became more unequally distributed. The other thing that you can see here is that as income shifts from one category to another, like for example as capital gains becomes more important as a source of income, and it's more unequally distributed, then the whole distribution of income is going to be more unequal as well. Uh, here's the, uh, in fact, this breaks it down. Here you see some periods, which uh, they may appear to you to be corresponding to presidential periods. Uh, and to some degree they do, but they also correspond to periods of um, this period ended in a recession. This period it ended in a recession. This was a period of not sustained economic growth because there was a recession at the beginning, but uh, uh, sustained economic growth, sustained economic growth. Uh, and you can see that during periods of economic growth, uh, inequality tended to increase. Uh, during periods of recession, it tended to decrease. Inequality tended to decrease. That's what the blue bars are telling you. And what, it, and, and, and what it's telling you overall is that inequality grew over this entire period, both because there was a shift of income to more unequal sources, like capital gains, and because labor income become, became more unequally distributed. About 80% of all of the growth of inequality came from the growing inequality of labor income, and about 20% resulted from the shift towards capital gains. Some interesting things about that. Here you see what, the, what happened to the in, inequality for elderly, childish, household, childish <laughs> childless households. They are, elderly, childless households have very unequally distributed market income. That's because a lot of people uh, in, in, this, in this group rely on transfer payments and particularly Social Security, of course, and Medicare to, to, to provide for their standard living. But they have very high inequality, but it's not, it didn't grow very much. Why? It didn't grow very much because they don't rely on labor income. And since they don't rely on labor income, they don't, um, they don't, they, since they don't rely on labor income, they didn't experience the growth of inequality that, that people who earned labor income experienced. Here's, an, here, here's another application of the Gini coefficient. Here's what happened uh, to the Gini coefficient if you include the 1%. And here's what happened if you don't include the 1%. And you can see that it grew by inequality. The Gini coefficient, if you exclude the 1%, grew by about 17%. Uh, it grew by about 23% if you include the 1%. So that shows you how much that in growth of the 1% contributed to, uh, to inequality. Uh, and here's a, a last thing about the 1%. Uh, 
labor income, this shows how much, how important labor income was to that 1%. And the interesting thing here is that labor income has always been very important to the 1%. Okay. It's always been very important in this, and which kind of flies in the face of what we think, kind of think. I mean, when you think of the super rich, historically, you know, Cornelius Vanderbilt and so forth, or, di or the Carnegies or whatever, you, you kind of think of big capitalists, you know, big profits. But in fact, labor income is a very important component of the income of the super rich. So which is, again, why we need to study the, 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 the uh, labor income. So let me quickly go through this, and then we'll call, I'll call it a day. We have, um, when we're trying to understand what are the sources of inequality in household labor income, what are they? Well, one, and the biggest one, is differences in hourly wages. Okay. Without doubt, that's the that's the, the most important driving factor, um, and I'll I'll talk about that a little more in a second. Another is the number amount of hours worked. Okay. It doesn't depend on just how much you um, you earn per hour, but also how many hours you work during the year. Um, and it turns out that for men, at any rate, there has been some growth of inequality due to, to inequality in the number of hours worked. For women, not so much. Um, and then uh, another important factor is women entering the labor force. And remember, we're talking about households here. As women enter the labor force, um, they, they're in, entering the labor force may or may not increase inequality. It depends on do they enter the labor force at the lower end of the income spectrum or do they enter it at the higher end? Are their incomes highly correlated with their husband's incomes or not? Um, because if, if Men who are earning relatively high salaries, their, women, their wives start to work, and they also earn relatively high salaries, then that's going to exacerbate uh, income inequality. The evidence is kind of mixed on that. But let's go on and look at the hourly wage thing. So we're looking at wage dispersion. What is it that caused, over this 30-year period, wages to become much more?